the Lebanese are still here. They, in theory, govern themselves. Uh, you've had successive elections. You've had points where elections were postponed. You've had governments. You've had caretaker governments. Mm. Okay. You've had moments of elite consolidation mm -hmm. and elite competition. And all of that has yielded the same thing from a citizen's standpoint, which is the dearth of governance. Okay. Fiscal, monetary, and economic problems, political gridlock, constitutional crises. Yeah. So the question is, all of this is for what? Anthony Elgesane, I'm a lawyer, writer, and non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute. If we're contrasting the sort of geopolitical or the high-level political problems mm -hmm. of 2005 with what we see now, I think what we see now is, to an extent, an outgrowth of those failures. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So when you're protesting because your own leaders can't pick up the trash, yeah. right, that's a governance point. Right. That's, that's a problem with, with corruption, yeah. inefficiency, ineptitude, mm -hmm. right, lack of vision, and so on, yeah. that people are still talking about today. Right. Uh, right. And I think it's, it's crazy to think of when you look back to 2005, there were skeptics who would sort of smirk and say, you know, heaven help the Lebanese when they govern themselves. <laughs> and now you sort of see, okay, for 15 years, right? See, the new heaven the, hasn't been up much up. Right, this little slice of heaven on earth for 15 <laughs> years has governed itself, okay? That's, that's 15 years, uh, that's as long as the occupation era, mm -hmm. and that's as long as the civil war. Right. What do we have to show for it here? Yeah. It's a pyramid of problems built upon uh, a false foundation, really, that things could always be worse. Okay, well, that's and, and that's what I think has kept people locked into this system for so long. I like that analogy. Right? So instead of, you know, like these activists striving to make things better, mm. you accept because you've seen that things can get a lot worse, and so you make do with what you have. But when you say a lot worse or things could get worse, are you implying? the darker years of our history? In other words, that it could just be chaos and violence like the Civil War years? Or is it something else? I'm, I'm not implying that. I think leaders have both impliedly and expressly stated that. So that is a built-in almost uh, acceptance of how abnormal things are. And therefore, the abnormal state of affairs becomes normal to a point. Am, am I getting that right? That passion and persuasion against all the odds, reaches a, uh, a wall of sorts. And so, then, so Joe Bahout, I think, uh, has mentioned this in conversation with you and others, others who you read, Michael Young. And other, the problem in Lebanon sometimes is day-to-day -day issues in Lebanon are, yeah. are intertwined, intermittently intertwined mm. with the, what you call geopolitical problems, what you could call the communal order, mm. sort of the intercommunal mm -hmm. uh, pluralism. And... It becomes very hard to achieve these tangible changes because every, unless you're changing like everything at once, right. uh, yeah. you sort of sacrifice that particular demand you're making because you run into these multiple walls. There's no center of gravity. Mm -hmm. It's a, on the one hand, people call it a regime. I think it's more like a loose order mm -hmm. um, where it's very hard to displace yeah. everyone at once. And when you displace only some of the people, mm. you inevitably push some of your fellow citizens into a, into a corner. Right. It could be inadvertent, but now people, for example, might look at what's happening with the premier who resigned, Saad Hadidi, mm -hmm. and say, well, all right, the cabinet's collapsed. The cabinet is, sure, it's a collective body endowed with executive authority, mm -hmm. but it's led by a Sunni premier. Mm -hmm. Why is the Maronite presidency, mm -hmm. to use that unfortunate sort of designation, uh, a red line? Why is the Speaker of Parliament, right, Nabi Hibiri, Shia politician, a red line? Mm. And so you've already seen at least some people who were initially with these demands for change react negatively now to a perceived imbalance in how that change has been implemented. And that automatically politicizes it. Of course. And I, okay, so in this sense, I want to go back to the initial outburst in October and compare that to what we're seeing now. Late October, there were, there were flickers of that, where we saw attempted protests, may have even been early November, protesters going up towards Babda, but of course not reaching Babda. Uh, 
it may have been mid-November, late November, we saw sporadic violence in front of Nabi Ahbari's home in Ayn al -Tini. So we saw, we saw small attempts, nothing, of course, nothing nearly as dramatic as what we saw in downtown, or for that matter, in Tripoli or Nabati. Do you think the hesitation is, is built in that even those that would have liked to see proper regime change, meaning the presidency, the Speaker of Parliament, and the system collapsing, that they themselves are unable to, are unable to get there from, from really just the way Lebanon is built, that there's a communal anxiety at stake, and going after the presidency is not just going after the president, it's going after a component. And I, I'm curious about the psychological stuff happening. And the reason I'm asking you this is, I've had this conversation with friends and, and people, and we, we spoke about it briefly earlier, that there is an issue with using the word revolution if you're unable to go all the way. And I'm just wondering why that's the case. It seemed like there was a desire for genuine revolution to happen, and it's it's not there. I would agree. I mean, the word, words and word choice, uh, that all matters. Mm. Um, you could think of this as a revolt, a revolution, a campaign for change, mm. uh, a campaign for reform. Mm. Uh, I, I, you know, a lot of different people can think differently about the same yeah. event or events and their surrounding context. So I don't want to speak for everybody in sure. Lebanon. I would say that I think where the where the tension comes is while everyone in Lebanon wants the things these uh, protesters, peaceful or not, say they also want, which is you know good roads, good schools. Mm -hmm. Power 24-7, ideally, mm -hmm. but regularly. Uh, drinking water, a uh, funny, funny framework music. that would allow you yeah. to at least have a fair chance of pursuing fulfillment, purpose, and happiness, right. and so on. Yeah. We talked about offline, and I don't want to repeat the things I said, the Byzantine uh, bureaucracy a great that makes yeah. every day, to quote someone else, a prize-swallowing siege. Right? Mm. Um, that, that is, people want to change all of that. At the same time, though, a lot of people have other sets of hopes, fears, aspirations, okay? And right. those can be entangled with their identity, mm -hmm. which can also be communal or factional or political. Right. And that, you know, sometimes you have conversations with folks who are clearly having trouble yeah. reconciling a real understanding, mm -hmm. a sincere one, I'd say, yeah. that all these leaders, okay, are part of this loose order that has given you this pyramid of problems. Mm -hmm. At the same time, pick favorites. Right. The example being, you, yeah. you have this favorite faction over that one, right. or right. this leader right. over that one, or you know maybe he or she has stolen, but not as much as the other one. But is that an inertia that that the average person is still unable to overcome that obstacle? Because I know what you're describing. I think is a repetition in Lebanese history that that certain events happen that could po lead to positive change. But there's the structure, the way Lebanon handles itself over time, seems to work against any change. In, in my mind... Yeah, I, but sorry, yeah. the, the events are different. So I, we'd have to look at each case. If you're looking at, for example, if we're isolating constitutional uh, design and practice, so yeah. the way the system works, mm -hmm. um, you've had uh, moments of unrest yeah. that were triggered by something like taxes or a, an unfavorable monopoly or an economic sure. crisis. Here, it's a little different, mm -hmm. but you're running into the same obstructions. You can see people are genuinely frustrated. Yeah. And they've been protesting peacefully for months. But not only that, they've been tolerating this system for decades. Right. On the other hand, it's clear that the leadership okay, still retains its tools of influence maneuver and manipulation, and is still very adept at exploiting unrest. Right. And so, I, you know, I don't want to judge anyone in particular. I don't want to mm -hmm. comment mm -hmm. on, did person X do Y for Z reason? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So this is a but I would say yeah. what's, what's absurd is to look at this uh, sort of swelling and these acts of violence, and people on both sides have committed acts of violence, and just judge people mm. and sort of write off what they're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I 
personally, I'm opposed to certain uh, methods that have been adopted, not just in the past couple of days, mm -hmm. uh, speaking of the violence, but also certain obstruction of public spaces and thoroughfares. Yeah. But at the same time, if you don't apply pressure, what's going to change? Is the pressure, in your opinion, at this moment? The, I'm not. I, and it's I, sorry. I it's really, funny yeah. to me when people who, you know, not someone who's navigated the system as a business owner or who's paid, I don't know, a facilitation fee to, you know, settle uh, something at court. I'm talking about the pillars of, course, of the order. And that's, it's funny to see pillars of the order now tell people to just sit home and twiddle their thumbs while they figure out if Talal Irslin, of all people, is going to get X ministry or Y post. A hundred percent agree with your description. Even the, among the protesters, it's a dynamic movement. And it has multiple components, and it's unfair to say these are all one sort of, one type of person, I think. Even within a person. You, you as an yeah. individual, I guarantee, yeah. have multiple motivations mm -hmm. for acting, for behaving in the world. Sure, and I actually And it's hard sometimes to determine which of them is dispositive, which of them yeah. drives the decision. I think that's a very astute observation where a lot of talking heads maybe don't have that sort of careful uh, delineation of uh, what each protester has in mind. So I think that's an important thing to remember always. But I would like to step out for a moment and just look at it as an external observer. Do you think that this is a regime in all of its facets pushing back for its survival? Or is this a regime that's comfortable with what's happening to a point and perhaps, perhaps letting certain influences within the regime take the, take the burden, take the brunt? And the reason I'm going back to the earlier examples of October, early November is that it just seemed like the pressure was on, on the most symbolic structures within the regime. That's the head of the state. That's the Speaker of Parliament. I assume the protesters now, the majority, want the same demands that they did three and a half months ago. But I also am a bit perplexed why that's not the forefront any longer. That it's... I guess what I'm asking is, are we seeing in relatively short period of time what happens over and over in Lebanese history, which is the regime adapts to the situation and in a way just navigates and finds a way to come out. Comes out limping sometimes, comes out even more disfigured, but it, it's always able to cope without being, without being hard on the protesters or being light on the regime. I don't mean it that way. I just mean in terms of, is, is this a sort of, are we witnessing it live, the regime sort of doing its dance and, and finding a way forward? When you look at the intercommunal elite, mm. and that's the word I would prefer yeah. the regime, that's just nice, because, yeah. <laughs> not to excuse anyone's nice. no, okay. behavior, yeah. but I, I don't know <laughs> if I would think of it as a, as a regime, because I think at times there are subsets of the elite that feud with each other too frequently and too right. intensely right. to say that, you know, this is a regime a la Syria or, or, Absolutely. or yeah. you know, Iraq under Saddam. Or, that said, the intercommunal elite, I think, has consolidated over the past few years because it has felt from various fronts, whether it was external pressure, uh, there's conflicts in the region, yeah. and uh, foreign policy problems, mm -hmm. as well as internal pressure, the increasing dissent. Yes. Uh, we've talked about the protests, right. the municipal elections, yeah. the 2018 parliamentary elections. Absolutely. Uh, they've managed, I think, you know, if you look at the, the top line, yeah, they've, they're still in power. Mm -hmm. They control the vast majority of parliament, mm -hmm. the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> they still retain hundreds of thousands of followers, each party or yeah. each major party. Yeah. And yet they have felt this pressure. So I think uh, when, you, when you look at that, yes, the elite is surviving. If we're looking at how they're reacting to these protests in particular, mm -hmm. I wonder if, if they know what they're doing all the time. So mm. on the one hand, yes, the elite is waiting. Mm. And by waiting, they're forcing protesters, I think, to confront the reality that they have a uh, few tools available to them right now right. to achieve uh, tangible change rapidly and to secure and sustain success. 
Right. Okay. And so they've had to, I think, experiment and adapt through this iterative process. Me- meaning, letting the, protesters, in, I'm not not in, not encouraging them, but sh- but giving them no choice but low level violence. Well, no, I don't. I'm not saying that necessarily. Oh. I'm saying that on the one hand, it looks like leaders are are waiting them out. Uh-huh. On the other hand, it's also clear that leaders are struggling with or have no clue about the depth of the problems Lebanon is facing. Mm-hmm. So it's hard. It's hard to pinpoint and say this is a waiting game, or this is just a continuation mm-hmm. of the poor practice of politics that we've talked about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Now, if we're assuming it's a waiting game, yeah. I think it has worked to an extent because you are no longer getting hundreds of thousands of people in the streets. Right. Right. The majority right. of citizens haven't been participating yeah. in the past uh, few protests. Absolutely. On the other hand, if it's politics as usual, uh, and you have a blind side, I don't know if leaders are going to be comfortable with what happens to them in a few months. When, while they're still feuding over right. uh, posts in the cabinet and shares in the government, yeah. the uh, economy collapses. And you have more people without jobs, mm. without income, without anything to occupy their time, with frustration, without a sense of purpose or dignity. That sounds like a recipe for more of this. But I can't, I can't answer the question you're asking confidently and say, this is how the elite is reacting. I think there are subsets of the elite yeah. that are manipulating this for political gain. There are subsets that are hubristic and think, as always, they're going to come out clean. Right. And there are subsets that, frankly, don't have a clue uh, regarding the challenges they, their own constituents and the Lebanese at large are going to face in the next year. October 17, I don't think anyone who went to the streets, October 18, 19, 20, that first weekend, had in mind Hassan Dieb as the next prime minister. So that is the regime nominating someone trying to pacify the protests. So to some degree, it did take some. That's people. a subset of the re- the the order, right? It's a subset of the elite well, that, nominating him, exactly. Right? Because another subset doesn't want to own the problem, yeah. Perhaps mm. or wants to profit politically mm. off of the discontent that's going to be directed towards whichever cabinet is formed. Yeah. Right. So I'm just. Yeah. No, but that's true. But that's my point. That it's within the regime you have obvious tensions and. I don't know if I'm reading this right. Are we seeing now that one side of the regime or that one component of the intercommunal elite, which is a better way of describing it, uh, trying to throw the other side of the communal elite under the bus? It looks like there's something fighting for survival. And that could be, that could be on both sides. The protest momentum, sort of giving a last push and certain groups within the intercommunal elite may be gasping for air. And I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm reading this correctly, that the revolutionary sentiment that, the, that this all started with has sort of fizzled out. And now we're seeing rage. And we're seeing perhaps literally a fight for survival. And that's very different than the sort of initial outburst of what people wanted, what they were hoping for. Well, okay, so you're seeing a few things, yeah. Mm. On, on the one hand, the regime, as you call it, the intercommunal elite, to use my words, right, is, is reacting the, to the people's see, behavior. Yeah. And in their reactions, just like in 2015, they're reshaping the context. Mm-hmm. A great example, I think, personally, is when people are protesting the trash, you put up a wall, people start protesting the wall, you take down the wall, it just keeps moving yes. the lightning exactly. rod for the for the descent. Hundred okay. percent, exactly. Now, that's the that's you, that's the best analogy. Yes, okay. they they've put up a barrier, right, which is internal security, right? In a sense, they're saying, okay, now this is your issue. You go fight it. Well, it, some but, bank bank stores got yeah. a bit of a, uh, the they got attacked too, but it's mostly been a battle with internal security. On the other hand, you have uh, others in the elite mm. that are clearly trying to. Uh, I think, force the issue with whatever cabinet is formed. Mm. And I wonder sometimes if that's expressed in 
the different security services responses right. and behavior. Right, right. Uh, and again, we can call back to what happened to protesters in 2015 mm -hmm. when certain parties, thugs, uh, took to the streets, not only to beat up people, but to change the nature of the protests as, as Lebanon saw them. Yeah. And that is back to your point about uh, building hesitation and fear, right? Yes, yeah. But back to your question here, the second thing I think that's happening is that the, the country is changing. So since the protests began, not, not that there's causation, but yeah. there are more people without jobs. Hundreds of thousands or more, potentially. Right. Okay? Right. The dollar inflows keep, uh, well, I Lindor. think right now we have a, basically, if you look at truly available money, a finite amount that the state and state-connected actors have to spend to meet different needs. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. With very little ability to draw in new money. Right. Okay? That's causing and will cause problems fiscally, monetarily, and economically. Yes. That in turn are affecting people's frustrations. So... If three months ago I could look at the system and say, all right, I want political change, mm. I want new uh, order, mm. I can't do that now if I'm hungry. Now it's about, back to your point, survival. So it's in a way, this is now the beginning of desperation. That... For a lot of people, yes. Yeah. I mean, you've seen, look, so this is not just the beginning. People have set themselves on fire. People have sure. killed themselves. Sure. That's true. People are taking risks. Absolutely. Uh, not just, you know, commentators and... and and bloggers and, and lawyers uh, yeah. like me, but people in the streets. Um, we see Carlos Wilson <laughs> taking great risk too, yeah. <laughs> not in a different way. <laughs> no, you, yeah, you, you've got all that happening, and at some level, I've always thought that it won't be as bad as the worst case projections. Mm. And I thought in the past people were too negative when assessing uh, how Lebanon was doing in the moment, but. The, the truth is, Lebanon's caught up to those yes. scenarios and assessments. Right. Today's worst case scenarios are worse than yesterday's. Right. And sure. you know, one factor in looking at how it'll all unfold is the behavior of the leadership itself. And the same leadership that's given you nothing but a pyramid of problems for 30 years is now horse trading instead of acting. focused in heavily on Lebanese issues the last three months, which is a good thing. That the, the geopolitical nightmare that we live in has been a side story. It did come up briefly with Qasem Soleimani's assassination, his killing, but that, I think, was the most geopolitical moment that we've had the last few months, which is in a way something new. That we are literally, ex we're, protesters are fighting for a better Lebanese state. Pure domestic accountability. And I, get, I, I gauge Western, I, I get the feeling that they're not as interested in our story this time around. That there's almost like a reluctance to even get involved. But I also see something new, which is, and I want to get your opinion on this. Within some circles, and they may be mostly in the U.S., you have voices saying, well, the Lebanese state is the problem. And funding any component of the Lebanese state is problematic. And all of this is stuff that the West is doing and it should not do it. And that's a new, I think, a new thread that's emerging where, to a degree, the protester and the Western expert, is, they're seeing eye to eye that the state should fall. That doesn't spell out Western support for Lebanese protesters. It seems to be a, a little more convoluted and perhaps complicated. Do you think there's any momentum to see a massive shift in Western policy towards Lebanon? And let's start with the US, that the US government sort of tripped on itself trying to send money to the Lebanese army a few months ago do you sense that something like that may become the norm here, where they don't support, they don't send money, they, in a sense, sort of look at this country as a pariah state, and it increasingly becomes under sort of, whether it's Iran or the other, sort of like a Russian sphere, Syria sphere again, like it was not too long ago? And I, I mean, just broad view on this, because I, 
without the without any personal preview, just sort of reading what I've read. Well, tell me what you think. I get the feeling that that's an, that's a opinion that is increasingly shared among officials abroad who don't mm-hmm. necessarily see the need to fund anything when it comes to Lebanon. I think it's important to connect the conversations mm. for sure mm. um, because people's geopolitical perspectives do affect the issues uh, that the Lebanese care about. That's mm-hmm. just the reality. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. to divorce the two, while it makes sense mm. in wanting to engage in self-assertion mm. and claw back autonomy mm. and work towards independence to say, you know, what we care about are these issues. Yeah. <clears throat> Those issues are connected to the region we live in mm. and to other states' perspectives regarding that region mm. and their policies towards it. Mm. So if you're looking at the question you just asked, there have been people in the United States, in D.C. specifically, who have argued for years now, not just recently, mm. that the United States government should be reducing or cutting mm. uh, security sector assistance to the Lebanese Republic. Yes. And that's in the form of assistance to the Lebanese uh, armed forces mm-hmm. as well as the internal security forces. Yes. Let's take two examples. Uh, as well as you know, increasing sanctions uh, regarding Hezbollah, yeah. particularly, but also others. And there are all sets of sanctions that could be applied in or towards Lebanon based right. on the Syrian regime's behavior here or, or corruption can yeah. trigger sanctions and so on. Right. Uh, and then there's also the human rights file, like the Leahy law and issues like yeah. that. Yeah. So when you look at the strategic interests and, and the democratic ideals of the United States, there can be a case, I think, uh, in engaging states around the world to consider how, consider carefully how the United States does that. Mm-hmm. What's happening here in the context is, yes, sometimes people who are advocating to reduce, for their own reasons, reduce assistance uh, for the Lebanese Republic are aligning with, let's just say, protesters Mm. who are frustrated with the behavior of security services and who see as complicit the Western states who provide them not only with uh, weapons Mm. or uh, uh, equipment, Mm-hmm. but training and, and support right. and funding. Uh, so I think that's another case of people having separate conversations, that's thinking about the problems differently, coming to the same, I guess, bottom line, if you want to call it that. Yeah. I personally, because uh, I'm an American, uh, disagree uh, if the question is, you know, how should the United States treat uh, the state in Lebanon? I, I think there's a difference between looking at something being frustrated with it, mm. looking at a problem, be it uh, Hezbollah mm. at a strategic level, mm. or uh, the factionalism more broadly and the corruption more broadly, mm-hmm. that keep the state weak to a point, and then use the state in a way to suffocate society, perversely enough, which right. keeps it strong in other senses. There's a difference between be- being frustrated with that and saying that doing X will yield Y. Uh-huh. Right? Okay. I think a lot of the policies uh, being proposed by the voices you're talking about are actually counterproductive. Mm, 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 okay. The answer to me isn't to just cut off assistance or cooperation and to treat Lebanon as a pariah state. The answer, in my view, is to build a partnership over time and use your influence and leverage in such a partnership. Again, just to be clear, mm. an American looking at a problem has every right to look at it from his or her interests. Mm -hmm. A Lebanese person has that same right. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the demands will not always be uh, overlaid and consistent. Uh, Sometimes there there will be contradiction, not just inconsistency. The stumbling blocks to getting there, Mm -hmm. were they primarily a Lebanese issue? Or do you think they were more like just tied up to regional problems that that kind of policy did did not yield sort of... uh, which, which stumbling blocks, which policy? Dissuasion to abandoning the Lebanese yeah. security apparatus. Well, it's also not just about security. That's, that's on me for focusing on that. That seems to be prevalent now. But, um, yeah. but I mean, there's all kinds of support provided through USAID, just to take the American case. Sure, sure. And, and access to markets, access to the financial system that in turn lets the Lebanese, mm-hmm. I mean, let's forget for a second, 
how leaders have, have strangled the state and society. But let the Lebanese engage in the world, mm -hmm. make a living, send money back home. That dissuasion to abandoning Lebanon, which I share with you, wanting the Lebanese state to, or encouraging the Lebanese state to behave differently. What do you think were the, the problems that did not encourage the Lebanese state to get to where you would want it to be today? In other words, we have a situation over time where there's a non-state actor that appears to be more powerful in certain ways than the state itself. And now we have, and I'm just drawing a few lines here, we have images which are startling at times of grenade launchers, the Lebanese army bringing them into Martyr's Square, not going to use them, but just a show of force. We have tear gas. And I think all the comments that I saw were that how could the French supply the Lebanese army with so much tear gas to use against its citizens? It almost seems, it almost seems, I, I mean, I, I'm just I sort of, okay, the internal security, that this is not m assistance or money that was encouraging Lebanese sovereignty. It was, it seems to be like it just sort of has only been used recently against Lebanese protesters. Look, there's definitely a tension. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an ugly tension at times. Mm. When, whether it's you know, American officials or, or people mm. just looking at it from a desk, yeah. uh, supporting the semblance of state institutions that Lebanon has yeah. to build them up and understanding that, I mean, even now, these institutions are operating without leadership or vision from the top. Mm. And so, if you're looking at it from the vantage point of the ISF, for instance, yeah. you need to maintain order. Right. You need to prevent people from vandalizing. I'm not excusing behavior, I'm just sure, saying. Sure. This is, yeah, yeah. At the same time, I imagine members of the ISF themselves and in the Lebanese military yeah. sympathize with these protesters and understand yeah. that people want what they themselves want for their country. Right. The question is sometimes how you execute a mandate, mm -hmm. okay, in the absence of real leadership, hmm. when you're surrounded on all sides so by le people. Leadership is part of the issue here? I think leadership, well, the lack of leadership is a big yeah. issue. Okay. I think factionalism is a huge issue because Hezbollah is the most powerful and most problematic such party in Lebanon, but mm -hmm. it's not the only one, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Thuggery is a problem, yeah. right? And you've seen, if we go back to October and trace these protests sure. for now, yeah. you've seen thugs from political parties come out and beat peaceful mm -hmm. protesters, mm -hmm. clash with different security services. Absolutely. You've seen members of security services clash with thugs, with peaceful protesters, with members of different security services, uh -huh. and sometimes members of their own units. And this isn't just about Lebanon. This is, a, I think, a deeper problem regarding... Uh, security sector institutions in particular, right. in divided societies, where you have a fragmented political class that has over time built uh, different agencies and departments to be instruments of factions, as opposed to instruments of a state that in turn is an instrument of the people. Is there a way... But the question is, sorry, yeah. back to your initial question in this conversation. If I'm a U.S. policymaker, or if I'm a European official, or if I'm someone with the UN, how do I work with these institutions, right, if I identify an interest in doing so, mm. to get them from where they are today mm -hmm. to where they themselves want to be, and we as Americans or as Lebanese citizens, right, want them to be for various reasons. Right. And it's not just about equipment. It's not just about training. Sure. It's about a galvanizing idea about a culture. Uh, is, that we is, is that in Lebanon, something? if we're looking at it from the Lebanese mm. standpoint, sometimes lack more broadly. Is that something within the toolbox of U.S. policy towards Lebanon? What you're what you're saying right now, the what the ideal situation is that something that the Americans are even able to help deliver, or is it really beyond foreign? No, policy? but you have to do what's necessary so that others can do what's sufficient. So that means, just because it's not sufficient doesn't mean it isn't necessary for you. What, right? what, That's what, a precursor sure. of what we're talking about. But what you're saying is necessary, I'm assuming, is on the Lebanese side. 
Meaning the Lebanese? Well, it's on both. It, it just depends on the assumption you're making mm. and on the vantage point. Mm. So if I'm a U.S. official, yeah. if I think I have an interest in Lebanon, right. if my interest is, for instance, uh, maintaining stability in the Levant, uh, countering the influence of Hezbollah, I'm, I'm not saying these are the interests, I'm saying mm. this is what you read and hear, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, Perceived interest. engaging yeah. in counterterrorism operations, you need to then support the institution so that it can get to, with its own volition and work, where it needs to be. Right. On the other hand, from the Lebanese standpoint, okay, you want to maintain relationships with states yeah. that are providing you with hundreds of millions of dollars a year, mm -hmm. with diplomatic support, mm -hmm. with access to the financial system, mm -hmm. with assistance outside of the security sector, with homes for diaspora Lebanese who send their dollars back. Yeah. So that's back to the overlap. Now, if I'm a protester, to take it back there, and I see what members of the security services are doing, I'd be outraged. The problems of pluralism and factionalism exist in a lot of institutions in Lebanon. It's not just the security sector institutions. But the question is, if we're looking at it from an American standpoint, right? you're talking about the geopolitics and Western policy. Mm. If we're empathizing with a decision maker, Mm. Okay. If he or she identifies interests and wants to assert those interests in a part of the world, then he or she needs to do what's necessary so that others may do what's sufficient. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's mm -hmm. partnership. Yeah. If you're looking at Lebanon specifically, okay, you've, in part because of your own policies in the past, right, American abandonment of, of the Lebanese state and, and political allies within mm -hmm. Lebanon uh, for the 1990s and early 2000s, mm -hmm. You've inherited, and that, of course, the security sector institutions and other institutions were within the Syrian orbit right. for a long time. But you're inheriting that problem. Okay? You need to then build from that baseline. Mm -hmm. okay? And you've been doing so for 15 years. The professionalism and the performance of the Lebanese armed forces and of the internal security forces, to name two in particular, yeah. it's a lot better today than it was 15 years ago or 10 years ago. Mm. And it's a lot better, I think, frankly, than in other states around the region. If we look at the responses to protests, is it good enough? No. And, and should every uh, uh, consideration be made in relative terms? Of course not. Mm -hmm. Okay, Because that's an excuse for failure and for shortcoming. Yeah. At the same time, you know, we have to be, uh, I think, cognizant of the long term yeah. uh, and patient Right. in building the sort of state we want to see so as a partner. So now, from the Lebanese standpoint, the, uh -huh. the question is sort of similar. How do you achieve the sort of professionalization and accountability that prevents or at least punishes this behavior in the future? And that's in the interest, I think, of the Lebanese, and it's in the stated interests of the West. Right. So why not work towards that? Okay. And again, that gets us back to our question, is this a revolt? Mm -hmm. Is it a revolution? Is it a campaign for evolution? Mm. Can it be all three? Mm. And how does that affect uh, policy of friendly states? Or purportedly uh, friendly states? I guess it depends on the context. American analysis seems to be inward looking these days. And very little appetite for grievances among locals in the region. And to me, it was, that's disappointing because I would want American voices to support the average protester getting to a better place in this part of the world. It seems to be that there's just no, no appetite for that at the moment, at the moment. And I don't mean this in just Democrat-Republican. I mean, I mean it sort of uh, across the aisle that too many American voices don't seem to care whether the Arabs are better off or not. And just your opinion on that. Did, did you feel the same kind of unusual perspectives emerging? The perspective a citizen of any, of any given state has mm. is to an extent inherently inward looking. So, you know, just like we look at Lebanese protesters and say, well, it makes sense, you know, whether it's how you get to what you want to achieve or not, it makes sense that you want to focus purely on local questions. Mm. It also makes sense for, you know, the so-called average American or a certain American pundit Hmm. to look at a, 
assassination abroad or, or any foreign policy move and say, mm. well, is this in our interests? Should mm. we even be doing this? Could we have done it differently? Are we ensnaring ourselves in a region? Those questions make sense. I, I like you, would resist any isolationist impulse yeah. or even retrenchment. Mm. Um, but I, I don't know if those are unusual questions. I heard American voices, I read American voices defending Iran's so-called fight against ISIS and saying that, this is, that we're on the same side, that Iran is a bulwark against Sunni extremism. Or for that matter, uh, Iran was behaving the last few years once the nuclear accord was signed and that this strike is now putting Iran into an adversarial uh, position. I, I found that difficult to digest and I, I had an episode where I kind of uh, put the burden too much maybe on Michael Moore because <laughs> Michael Moore I know is not the, he's not the expert on Middle East affairs but people like him, these kinds of serial pundits. They're news pundits. They show up and they comment all the time. And not just him. Plenty were willing to say that, willing to express concern that Iran's tactics in the region may be helping America. And I found that to be a bit absurd. I, I believe, and you tell me if you disagree here, I believe that the protests in this part of the world, happening today in Lebanon, happening in Iraq, and happening in Iran as well, and to a certain degree in Syria at times, when they can protest. These countries, I think, are all going through a similar phase in their history, that they are protesting against an order that is primarily Iran's orbit, also defend, d demanding accountability and domestic reforms and fundamental change, and I think decency at the end of the day. So I do see that there are overlapping issues. I do think the average Iraqi is protesting for a better economic life and a more manageable political uh, structure. And I think Iran, the average Iranian protester, is, I think, demanding the same things, maybe in different contexts. Uh, downtown Beirut, I think it's all in the same mix. So yeah, if you're killing Qasem Soleimani and then you see this kind of euphoria on the streets happening before and after, I do think there's some disconnect from what, Amer what American uh, desires are and perhaps what American policies should be and what's happening on the ground. It almost, well, seems, because it almost seems like an inverse of what we saw 15 years ago. Well, certain people have reflexive views uh, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. There are Americans, like there are people in every state or mm -hmm. society, who, let's just say, might be inherently uh, anti-war, mm. and I guess in the current context could be left-leaning, though people on the left aren't the only people who are uh, anti-war. Right. Uh, they might look at something like that assassination, and yeah. in addition to, you know, objecting to it at a principle, mm. say that it's counterproductive in their view by identifying, as you said, mm. the. Mm primary adversary to be ISIS mm. or I guess at some maybe level that's not subtle or subtle uh, finding Sunni extremists to be more problematic or Sunni violent extremists to be more problematic than their Shia uh, majority counterparts talking about parties here and organizations so that yeah that to me is problematic mm. if that's your prison yeah. uh, because while there was maybe a de facto convergence brought about by the fact that ISIS was a common enemy, for example, right. that masked the lack of a common cause more broadly, yeah. we should be careful to then take that and translate it and say, okay, you know, the United States uh, and Iran have a shared interests more broadly in the current context. Right. That said... Lebanese, Syrians, Iraqis, and so on, anyone in this region protesting peacefully mm -hmm. it can be doing so for a different reason. A lot of the Lebanese, a lot of the Syrians, a lot of the Iraqis who are protesting okay, are focused on basic questions in their day-to-day -day lives. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Now, are those intertwined with the fact that 
the order in those states happens to be politically dominated by parties or, or groupings that are backed by Iran today, mm-hmm. sure, that overlaps. Mm-hmm. And then the question is, how do we get there in some of those states? Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. Right. And did American policy contribute to those conditions that we now find problematic? If that, we're assessing it yeah. from that external, high-level American vantage point. Now, that, that question you just asked, I always get the feeling that that's at the core of every viewpoint today when it comes to anything happening in the Middle East. Did America contribute to the situation that we're living through? I, I ask this question in the broadest sense. The, an old debate between the influence of America or the, the, the usefulness of American power versus the uh, disadvantages of having American influence. At the end of the day, is American reluctance in this part of the world or perceived reluctance, perceived uh, sort of distancing, do you think that that spells bigger problems for this part of the world going forward? I'm asking you because you have, you have both views. You're Washington-based, but you're in Beirut as well, and you're working at a think no, tank. Yeah, I live in Beirut. Too. Well, you live in Beirut, but you're working for an American think tank, and you, have, you do communicate regularly with Westerners who engage this part of the world. Can, is it fair to say that an America involved in the Middle East is better than America not involved? My personal perspective on that is Absolutely. that American involvement in the region or in any region can be, uh, I don't want to say a force for good, mm. but can be helpful depending on the context. Mm. And that the United States, if it pursues its longer-term interests mm. patiently and prudently, can work with the peoples of this region, I think, to improve and build a better order. But I, I would also say that a lot of different people, be they Americans or Arabs or, or Persians, uh, Turks, whatever, have different views on that question. Mm. The other thing I would say is that while questions are connected and intertwined, yeah. I, I don't know if American involvement or Iranian involvement or Russian involvement has much to do with certain problems in a place like Lebanon that we as, right. as Lebanese right. also might find frustrating. I see. Okay, so do you want to blame the Zionists for uh, the Byzantine bureaucracy we have to navigate every day? <laughs> do you want to blame the Farsi uh, conquerors for the inability of the judiciary to function properly? Do you want to blame Turks for the factional security forces here? Do you want to blame America for the... AUB. <laughs> oh, I went there. Yeah, I know, me too. <laughs> okay, good. Do you want to blame the United States for the fact that there's a lack of uh, O&M culture here, for example. Oh, O&M? O and operations and maintenance. So, you know, we build a nice airport, yeah. don't properly budget for how to run it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we build a road, and then you find puddles in the left lane of the highway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can't blame any... So at some level, yeah. whether... And it's, I'm not mocking yeah. people I care for deeply, mm. and I'm not saying that in the, cur- in the context that existed, I or anyone I know would have done better. But I am saying that certain questions are about self-reliance and self-assertion. Even if we acknowledge that other questions are, as you call them, geopolitical. Right. Do you sense with Trump potentially winning another term that you will see any shifts in current policies in the, in the near future? That, that there may be uh, certain things on the horizon that we're, un- we're not expecting. And I, and I mean it in the, what we have seen the last few years have been an increased uh, pressure against the banking sector here, against Iran, sanctions, uh, the Soleimani strike as well. Do you see more of that on the horizon? Should Trump win another term? It depends on, I think, the, the country and the context. I think... Mm. Um, if you look at, for example, Lebanon, aspects of American policy have been consistent mm-hmm. to a mm-hmm. point. Uh, 
across administrations. So now you've had uh, Bush, Obama, and Trump all, I think, to a degree, maintain security sector assistance, mm. for example, while using sanctions to pressure particular parties and right. their enablers. Right. right. Now, obviously, those policies are connected to broader approaches, mm. but the thread's there. More broadly, I think if President Trump wins re-election, uh, you're going to see uh, policy shifts anyway, because mm. if you look at Syria, where I worked uh, yeah. for a while, yeah. policy shifted at times every few months, right. uh, often without, based on conversations I've had or reports you read, mm. without proper process, mm. arguably, mm. Mm. without uh, vision and care regarding the future. Mm. Um, so this is the last few years. Yes, yeah. and that's under one administration. Right, so right. It's hard to say that just because an incumbent might win re-election, that American policy, if there is a policy, will be consistent. Right. At the same time, aspects of policy towards the region have been consistent. Whether they're successful or not is a different question. Yeah. Like ramping up pressure towards Iran, ramping up sanctions, disengaging from the deal, engaging in and allowing others to engage in targeted strikes. That, to me, shows some level of consistency, yeah. whether you agree with the policy or not. Where I think it becomes problematic is in states like Lebanon, like Syria, that are, in the conventional sort of view, not central to American interests, but nonetheless invite intervention. You get this messier right. interaction, I think, yeah. where you're involved just enough, but the involvement depends, and is a function, depends on as a function of policies towards other states, mm. and you see, I think, potential for more inconsistency and, and variation. My hope and assessment is that friends of Lebanon in the world are able to support the people of Lebanon uh, and the state, as problematic as it is, as it helps them cope with the coming crisis, while somehow, and this is the difficult part, uh, not propping up the people who have been so problematic thus far. And I don't know if that's achievable in the short run, mm. but that gets us back to the question of do we do what's necessary today so that others can do what's sufficient tomorrow? That would be my hope. I think that's a very hopeful way to end this conversation, and I appreciate your perspective. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.